Okay, so we saw how we saw what threads are or how we think about threads. They are sort of parts of processes. And we saw how threads are used in all kinds of operating systems, Windows, Mac OS X, Linux, uh, other versions of Unix. And we also saw that we can use portable threads like pthreads or operating system native threads. And what we are going to do in this course is actually look at Linux threads, which is native to the Linux operating system. So Linux threads uh, are, are, are pretty um, different from things like pthreads. Linux refers to threads as tasks rather than threads. So processes are tasks, threads are tasks, they are all basically tasks in Linux. They do actually have a lighter, um, they are more, uh, they have a lighter presence in the operating system. That is, Linux threads are sort of sleeker and more efficient to start up than processes, but they, in the end, they are and in the kernel, they are managed sort of the same way as processes. So the main function call that we will be will be uh, looking at is the clone system call. There are others, and hardly anyone uses anything other than clone. And there's many ways to use clone. We will just look at a very very simple way to use clone. Actually, it's it's kind of complicated, but it's the simplest of all the alternatives. So thread creation is done through the clone system call. Now the name clone, I'm not so crazy about it, but um, and you, if you ask me, the fork function call should have been called clone, and the clone function call should have been called fork. So I think it should have been the other way around. They should have switched them, but this is what we ended up with. Okay, so what clone does is it allows a child task to share the process address space of the parent's process. Okay, unlike the fork system call or the fork function, so fork starts up a child, but it makes a complete copy of the parent task and the child now executes on that parent, on that copy of the parent, and the parent has its own copy. Actually, that's not completely true, but that's how you want to look at fork. And later on, you know, in, in more advanced courses, we look at further details of this. Right now, you're getting sort of a, a the basic view. So here's how you set up a Linux thread. So unlike fork, fork doesn't actually start a whole new process where you start execution from the point in which the parents call the fork. That's not how it works. The way it works in Linux is, for Linux threads is, let's say you have a function, and what you do is you execute a function in a separate thread. So if you want to do that, this is not exactly how you call clone. I've just simplified it so that it's easy to understand. So here's your main program. You initialize this global variable x to 0. You call clone on this thread task. Now, once again, this is not how clone works, but let's just assume that this is roughly, this is just sort of a pseudocode that just tells you roughly how things work. You ask clone to execute thread task in a separate thread, and you can call clone again. So this starts the, another thread and executes everything in this function. Once it's Once this function is done, that thread is done. Same thing for this thread task 2, it executes this function, and once it's done, it's done. Once this function is done, the whole thread is done. And then you can print out main. So it's you cannot really predict what, what main will print out. So why is that? Because you might start with x equals 0, you call thread task 1, you call thread task 2, they might do something to x, but before they have a chance to do anything, main might just print out, main might get to this printf first and say, x is still 0. Or thread task 1 might run and, and increment x from 0 to 3. And then thread task 2 might follow after that and um, multiply x, that is x is equal to 3 times 2, which is 6. So you could get the answer that main might print the answer 0, or it might print out 6, or it might print out 3. That is, thread task 2 might go first. It says x is equal to 0 times 2, which is 0. And then thread task 1 might execute and say x is equal to 0 plus 3, which is 3. So you don't know exactly what 
um, this program will print. So even a simple program, program like this, where you're starting up two threads um, and sharing one variable, it's hard to predict what exactly this will print. Chances are it will print zero, but it might also print three or six. Okay, so before we get to all of the other things that we have to tell clone about, we have to review some uh, pr uh, programming ideas in uh, C, that is how do you define flags. So remember, we might define different modes, and these are almost always powers of 2. So 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, and so on. And these might be called, for example, 1 might be called mode 1, um, 2 might be called mode 2, and so on. Right? These are mode 4 would be 2 to the power 3, which is 8, mode 5 would be 2 to the power 4, and so on. You might have up to mode 32. That is 32 modes in a 32-bit int. And these are, why do we do this? Because these are different bits in a single 32-bit number. Okay. And so this is how they would show up. This would be mode 1, and this would be mode 5. So bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, bit 4, bit 5. Actually, usually computer scientists start numbering from um, 0, so this would be bit 0, but just to make things a little bit more user-friendly, I call this mode 1, I call this mode 5 and position 5, and of course we start from the right end of the number. Okay, so let's say we have flag is equal to mode 1, so this would be a whole bunch of zeros and then a 1, and mode 5 will be a bit uh, bit 5 set to 1 and then four zeros after that. If you or the two modes together, that is flag and mode 5. Remember that this is a bitwise or. That is, takes ev any, every bit, and if there's a 1 in either position of, uh, sorry, if there's 1 in either one of the uh, two operands at a particular position, then the result gets a 1. Okay, so um, these are all things we just sort of skim over in this course and you will get a thorough treatment of this in computer organization that is next year. That's the course where you also learn assembly language programming. So it you get a you need a little bit of this and the reason is that we use these modes. Um, we use some information about the CPU structure that's really important for for uh, threads. Okay, so as far as Linux threads go, um, this is not exactly the same as other threads, but this is the picture you want in mind. You have your program code that's executed, that is loaded to a, for a process. You have files that are open and can be shared by the different threads. You have memory that's accessible to all the threads. So for example, in this very simple program, this global variable x can be seen by all the threads. They can be running at the same time. They would all see the same memory location for x. So when it says x is equal to x plus 3, this is using memory location that's uh, part of the parent, even though this is executing completely um, asynchronously. To be able to do this, now it turns out that uh, a single thread even though we tell it to execute a certain function, that function can call any number of other functions. To be able to do that, you definitely need a stack. And to be able to do that properly, you need a stack for each thread. And that is the key to starting up clone. So once you realize that each thread has its own stack, not just the stack that's uh, part of the process, its own stack, and you have to allocate memory for it, then you probably will have a much easier time a much easier time using clone okay so in addition to the stack you also of course you have to have its each thread has to have its own copy of cpu registers now here's the key so you have to allocate stack space um, and on intel cpus which is what we will be using you have to do it in a certain way so on um, when we on intel cpus as soon as you push something and I draw my 
address space like this, low address is at the top, high address is at the bottom, so this would be the address 0, and this would be the highest possible address. And so if you were to look at the stack like this, um, when you do a push, you have to look at the stack pointer as going towards lower addresses. That is, as you put in more things into the stack, a push operation, for example, will the stack grows towards lower addresses. So that's the idea that you want. Okay, so now, the way we do this is we have to tell the thread when we start it up using clone we have to give it a chunk of memory and we don't know how much space we will need so what I do in all my examples is I allocate 16,384 bytes that's 16 kilobytes okay I figure that's enough for most things that's why I chose that number so we have to malloc use the malloc function call and what that gives you is a pointer to the first location but if we were to use this as the stack top, then when you push something, we'll go outside the bounds of this memory chunk that we got from malloc. So what do we do? We say that the top of the stack is way down here at the bottom of the memory chunk that malloc gave us. How do we do that? We use pointer arithmetic. We say the stack top is equal to whatever value malloc gives up gives us, sorry, plus the amount the number of bytes that we asked for so stack top is let's say over here we add 16k which is the size of this and that puts the stack top right here at the bottom of that chunk of memory that malloc gave us now we say that we tell clone that this is where the stack top is and so you can use this stack top the understanding is that clone whenever it causes something to be pushed it will cause, because we're using Intel CPUs, the stack pointer will grow towards lower addresses. So this is a peculiarity of Intel CPUs. Now if you were using a completely different CPU where the stack grew towards higher addresses, we would not have to do this. This is only here. We only have to do this because we're using Intel CPUs. This is how Intel CPUs work. And Intel CPUs pretty much um, are used for every operating system. These is Mac, Windows, and oh, Mac OS, uh, Mac, <laughs> Windows, and uh, Linux. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at the some of the f other parameters that we ignored for a clone. So first of all, we do have to tell clone what the function is that we're going to call. So here's the function, and notice in this function we call it some other function, printf. Okay, so to be able to do that, we this thread that we're going to set up will need a separate stack and so here is the stack top now we have to pass clone a pointer to the top of the stack and when we say the top of the stack it's way over here okay this chunk of memory that we have these are low addresses these are high addresses because the push because the push operation grows the stack towards lower addresses we have to tell clone that this is the top of the stack it knows that pushing things onto the stack makes the addresses go lower so you do have to do this and this is one of the key pitfalls that people have they forget to do this addition and then they allocate the space but they they give the they give clone this location that is the lowest addresses and of course as soon as you push something onto the stack you go into some illegal memory access and your whole program crashes. So don't forget this step. The other pitfall is that people forget that every thread has to have its own separate chunk of stack space. And so what I've seen people do is set up two threads but give it the same stack space. That's guaranteed to cause you all kinds of headaches. It might work some of the time but a lot of time it won't. Okay so don't forget that separate stack top for each thread. Now, so there are some, there's a whole bunch of flags. Now, for to get started, this is all you need to do. Use the clone underscore VM flag. That is share memory. That's the basic idea. And you can or this with a whole bunch of other things. If you want to share files, if you want to share signal handles, you can or bit, do a bitwise or of clone VM with some of these other options. So take a look at the man page for clone and you will see a lot more of the options. 
And finally, you have to have a null over here to terminate that list of arguments.